is about the smallest effect size of interest. And I've been mulling this over a good bit recently. I've been involved in a few replication projects. And one of the things that keeps on coming up is this smallest effect size of interest. And it'll become a little clearer later. And the problems that I've come across for these uh, replication studies, they're just as relevant as I see them for deception research. So I guess it's a general problem in, in psychology that I'm going to be discussing, but we can take it today in the context of deception research. So let's begin. What is the smallest effect size of interest? Well, it's basically what the name implies. It's a smallest effect size that a researcher considers theoretically or practically meaningful. Um, a little more a little more, uh, what would you call it? a little more scientific of a definition. It's the smallest effect that the independent variable can have on the dependent variable to be considered theoretically or practically meaningful. And this might be obvious, but I really just want to drill this home. The smallest effect size of interest is not the same thing as statistical significance. And to make this point clear, here's a couple of effect sizes taken from the Holy Grail uh, de Paolo et al. 2003. So it's the deception cues, vocal pleasantness and facial pleasantness. And one produced an effect size of a D of 0 0.12 and one produced a D of 0 0.11. And as we can see, one is significant and one is not significant. But to say that one is more meaningful than the other is, is based on the significance is kind of absurd, considering that there's only a 0 0.01 difference in the effect size. So the question I'm, I'm asking you is not whether these are, are differing in statistical significance, but rather are they theoretically interesting? or practically interesting. And like, take a moment and consider how you'd answer that, or more importantly, why you would answer it the way you do. And maybe a follow-up question then is, the difference between these two variables, this 0 0.1, is that theoretically interesting? And again, why and why not? So it's, those questions that I'm trying to raise and trying to answer here today. Well, I'm not going to, spoiler alert, I'm not going to answer them. I'm more just raising the issue to discuss with, with you guys. So it's about what effect size, what is the minimal effect size that we consider theoretically or practically meaningful? And why is this important? Um, I think the main problem stems from the idea that the point null is rarely, if ever, true. And it's basically impossible to prove a point null hypothesis. Um, ultimately, this means if the null can't be proven, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to falsify a alternative hypothesis or any scientific claim, really. And that is, that's the angle I've come into it from these replication projects I've been involved in, being able to say whether the original claim and the original study has actually been conclusively disproven. And it turns out, unless someone specifies a smallest effect size of interest, it's virtually impossible to disprove a claim. And again, we can use this example from, from um, De Paolo et al. So one is significant, the other is not. Can we say that vocal pleasantness has therefore been disproven? It's definitely not a valid cue to deceit because it doesn't have a little asterisk beside it. I'm not so sure. But, and this is the big thing, if our alternate hypothesis isn't phrased as a point null, isn't defined as a point null, but rather as a 
by a smallest effect size of interest, then we are in a better position to disconfirm a claim. We're in a better position to falsify a claim. And this sharpens our theoretical reasoning. We're forced to think about hypotheses in terms of effect size and not just differences from the point no. So just to like plot it up for us, here's our point null hypothesis. So in order to disconfirm a claim, our result has to be exactly on that, which basically can't happen. So we have two findings here, and both of them aren't on the point null, and therefore both of them are valid. Both of them provide some sort of information, some sort of support for the claim. But if we specify our smallest effect sizes of interest, so we have an undirected hypothesis here, but we say that nothing bigger, nothing smaller than this effect here, than this line, or this line here, um, will be considered theoretically interesting, then we are in a position to falsify a claim. So this finding here would not support the claim, whereas this finding would. And in my view, this is the greatest value of, of, of being able to specify the smallest effect size of interest, that it means we can actually create falsifiable claims and, falsi and, by, and in turn falsifiable theories. Smallest effect sizes of interest are also required for frequentist equivalence tests and Bayesian ropes. So that the distance between your lower smallest effect size of interest and higher smallest effect size of interest, that's essentially your Bayesian rope, your, your region of practical equivalence. And unless you specify a smallest effect size of interest, you can't do these tests. So that's another important reason for this. Um, it also gives more meaningful power analyses. So if we can decide on a smallest effect size of interest, um, it becomes much easier to, to calculate our power analyses. Basically, we power the test so that it's able to detect the smallest effect size of interest. We don't need to use rules of thumb. We don't need to base our power analyses on previous research. And we don't need to power them so that we conveniently only have to collect 30 participants per cell. So long story short, there's a lot of advantages for the smallest effect size of interest if we are now able to specify one. Which brings me to the next point. How can we decide on a smallest effect size of interest? And this is where it gets tricky. This is where I don't think we're going to solve anything today, but I think it's worth that we all go home and, and think about this one. Because if we can crack this nut, we, we create a much more precise science that allows us to, to, to have a genuinely falsifiable claims. Um, in perception research, an obvious and natural candidate for the smallest effect size of interest is a just noticeable difference. So if people can't detect the effect, even if it's measurable in some way, then it's probably not sufficiently strong to be of theoretical interest for a perception researcher. Um, this is probably my favorite and clearest example of, of a useful smallest effect size of interest. I, and I think there are situations in deception where we can borrow this idea. So if we're talking about, for example, claims about what cues people use to make accurate deception judgments, and I don't just mean Dece deception judgments now, I mean accurate deception judgments, then I think the smallest or the just noticeable difference could be a viable smallest effect size of interest. So if we go back to the Q facial pleasantness, let's say for argument's sake that this is the true effect, that the actual effect of facial, facial pleasant, pleasantness is a D of 0 0.12. Liars are a little bit less pleasant than truth tellers. Now, if I make the claim that people use facial pleasantness to make accurate lie detection judgments, I'm implicitly saying that people also have to be able to perceive differences in facial pleasantness. 
And if they can't perceive a difference of facial pleasantness of 0 0.12, then there is no way that facial pleasantness can be an accurate informer of your deception judgments. So put differently, if we can't perceive this with the naked eye, it's not going to help us make accurate deception judgments. So that's one possible area where I think we can use the just noticeable difference as a smallest effect size of interest in deception research, but there's probably not many others. And if we're talking about more basic research on cues, then I don't think it's that helpful. Another one, of course, I, it is just to use rules of thumb, like Cohen's um, comes up, I think, quite regularly when you see people justify their power analyses. We're power, powering for uh, Cohen's D of 0.5 because it's a medium effect and that's common. Um, I'm not that convinced by these arguments. I think it's it's a pretty weak argument, to be honest, to just base it on Cohen's rules of thumb, but I've seen it done. Another one is to poll experts. Um, again, I don't know how much this is actually going to solve. I think it skirts the issue a bit. If we can't actually explain why we're deciding on this smallest effect size of interest, I'm not sure how helpful it's going to be just polling experts. One benefit of it, I suppose, is that we'd have a working definition of a smallest effect size of interest, something that we can all use common ground, if you will, when I'm um, discussing theories and cues in deception research. So maybe that's a way forward. I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, one thing I've been thinking a bit about is what I've called implicit guides for want of a better term. And my idea here is that the scale that you use is, is implicitly saying something about what you believe is the smallest effect size of interest. So if you take a, a tailor, for example, a tailor works in centimeters and millimeters. A tailor doesn't work in nanometers. So a tailor's smallest effect size of interest is going to be, the, be in the realm of centimeters and millimeters when, when making clothes. We can compare that to a graphene researcher. They are going to be very much interested in nanometers and probably not so interested in, in millimeters or centimeters. So their smallest effect size of interest is going to be much smaller. Um, I'm not sure if something like that can be used for, for deception research, but I think it's worth thinking about it a bit more. In a similar way, sample sizes can be an implicit guide to uh, a smallest effect size of interest. This, of course, would require that people have actually put thought into their sample sizes and I'm not sure how how often that is actually the case I think oftentimes people just rely on on rules of thumb and precedent for for choosing sample sizes and then if we're talking about a practical effect size smallest effect size of interest rather than a theoretical smallest effect size of interest it should be possible to do to base it on some sort of cost benefit analysis um and that, I think, is my 10 minutes up. So thank you for listening.